Hi everyone, and welcome to the Bloody Cute channel. So I noticed that my uh, nostalgia video got a lot of views, and a lot of people reminded me of some of the other things that are super nostalgic from Lolita past. So I thought that I would do it today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I thought, why not revisit this topic um, and give you guys a little more nostalgia from the 2010s. <laughs> so long ago. <laughs> so Law has been on this platform for quite some time and I'm sure we're all familiar with her newer content, but she actually started out with a Shit Lolita Says series. I don't know if anyone remembers, I assume people do because it was quite a big thing, but a while back there was a meme where people would make a shit blah -de blah says series. Uh, for example, like shit girls say, shit guys say, <laughs> things like that, shit teachers say. And Law made one about Lolitas. And oh my gosh, I love this series. In total, she made five videos about what Lolitas say, and then I think another three videos on what people say to Lolitas. Um, I actually watched this, I think before I started wearing Lolita, I... Gee whiz, that was a long time ago for my brain to remember. <laughs> I think it was one of the first kind of proper Lolita things that I watched. I talked about how Peachy was the first Lolita I watched, while Law was the second Lolita I watched. Uh, <laughs> I think. Brain? <laughs> Is that true, Brain? I don't know. <laughs> but this was one of the first pieces of Lolita content that I consumed, and it made me so excited to join the Lolita community. I don't know. I think if I hadn't watched it, I wouldn't have... I may not have even joined in with the community. Like, <laughs> that makes me sound like I love the drama because so much of it was about drama, but it was actually just like seeing Lolitas gather and the Lolita community having its own like in-jokes and things like that that got me really excited to participate. I wanted to be part of the in-jokes. So thanks, Lil. <laughs> Cheers. So when I first got into Lolita, obviously I couldn't really relate to any of it um, because I wasn't part of the community and I hadn't experienced things. <laughs> but the more I participated, the more I understood about her video and the easier I related to it. And what really intrigues me is that even after nine years of those videos being up, they're still so relatable. <laughs> But no matter how relatable it is, I still think we need an updated one. So if anyone wants to make an updated one, make an updated one, please. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and as I said in my last nostalgia video, I've made a playlist called EGL History and that is in it. So if you want to check out these videos, just go to the playlist. I've linked it down below. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm doing all the work for you. <laughs> So Molly Metaphora is not so well known and I don't know why. <laughs> I remember when her Lolita musical came out and it blew me away. I was amazed that there was someone with the uh, equipment necessary and the expertise as well to create something on par with De Deerstalkers and not have that many subscribers. Her individual videos have been pretty popular, but she still has a very, very minute amount of subscribers. And I, I'm just so confused by it. I really don't understand why. Go and subscribe to Molly Metaphora. She makes amazing videos. Her Kingsman parody was honestly amazing. I actually think it might be better than Deerstalkers. So I'm speaking of Deerstalkers, uh, I didn't talk about them in my last nostalgia video because I was a little unsure about if I wanted to. They l didn't really leave on bad footing with the Lolita community, but they kind of left on a bad foot. Like they were like, oh, we don't want to make Lolita content anymore because it doesn't give us views. So <laughs> bye losers. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it was kind of sad. And yeah, I'm salty. <laughs> but they have made so many iconic videos. But the first video that they made together was actually their own shit Lily to say video. They actually did make a short series. I think they did two videos and they were good, but honestly, they don't really rival Laws. I think Laws really captured more community, more of the spirit of the community. And it was funnier. I think Laws was more funny. <laughs> so that being said, they still produce some really amazing content like Mean Elitas, which was a Mean Girls parody and The Secret Life of the Lolita, which was a mockumentary about Lolitas that kind of came from a David Attenborough type like view. But my absolute favorite video of theirs has to be Lolitas Without a Cause. There's something so weirdly wholesome about it. Like it shouldn't be wholesome because they do hold up a bakery. <laughs> they do theft <laughs> and they're just acting like absolute delinquents through the whole thing but it's so wholesome and pure at the same time. And it genuinely makes me really miss meats, not because we're delinquents at meats, but I just miss like goofing around with my friends. I love it so much though. It's a really, it's, I think it's genuinely, I think it's one of their best videos. I think it is their downright, hands down, slam on the table. It's their best video, in my opinion objectively it's not it's not in my opinion and it's objectively their best video <laughs> so uh oh <laughs> this next one is bad nostalgia <laughs> like it's still quite a nostalgic thing but it's also not a good thing <laughs> i don't want to be mean to australia but only australians could make me sako cry <laughs> Look, okay, I've got a reason. I, I'm, I'm not being racist. It's because Australia produces, hands down, the best, most dramatic reality TV. I am now coming to this realization. Married at First Sight Australia season six is now airing in the UK. Uh, two years after it was filmed or three years after it was filmed. Um, and now all of us UK Brit people are watching it. <laughs> and Seriously, if you if you like if you like 90 Day Fiance, if you like trash reality, this is peak trash. This is peak trash. It's so good. It's actually mad. I have never witnessed reality TV like this, and it, I live for it every day of my life. When it comes onto the TV, I live for it, and I love it. That being said, yep, you are the only ones that could make me Sako cry. <laughs> to be fair, no one actually made me Sako cry. Like she didn't have to cry. She just, she wanted to cry, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> but the models were really mean about Harajuku fashion. Um, not to her face, but they were just really mean about it in that episode. And <laughs> uh, they were just, they were, they were being a bit disrespectful. But what actually happened with Misako was at the end of the episode, they, each of the models had to walk down the runway and they each got assigned a different Harajuku fashion basically to model. So I think it was Kogal, Fairy K, Gyaru, like normal Gyaru and Lolita. And obviously the model who was wearing Lolita got Misako to work with. And it was really cute. Like they went to Baby. I think they went to Baby. Did they go to AP? No, I think they went to Baby to Starshine Bright. And they were like trying on loads of different clothes. And the model was like, oh, bonnet, oh, bonnet. Oh. Um, and she just kind of continues this way throughout the whole episode. And then at the end, when they are practicing for the runway, Misako gives her like, it's basically she's wearing like these bunny ears with her outfit and so Misako's like, oh, can you do a bunny hop down the runway? And the model's just like, oh my gosh, she wanted me to do a bunny hop and I didn't want to do a bunny hop. This is so humiliating. <laughs> is my Australian accent good? Is it bad? I don't know. <laughs> but she was like, oh, this is so dumb. Why did she make me do a bunny hop down the rump? Bro, it's Harajuku fashion, bro. Like, why do you think? <laughs> it's called kawaii. <laughs> anyway, Misako's model doesn't win the fashion show. Uh, apparently there was a winner and Misako's model doesn't win it. Um, and Misako starts crying. 
and they frame it as if she's crying because she's sad that she didn't win. <laughs> but like, <laughs> all the mentors are crying because they're just so happy about everything. They're like, oh, it was just such a wonderful experience and I'm going to miss you. And, what? and they're just being so sweet and lovely. And they're clearly like upset because they're just overwhelmed with emotion. And um, Australia's Next Top Model decided to frame it as, oh my gosh, she was crying because uh, she didn't win. I can't believe that. Why is she acting like a child? I don't get it at all. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's go on to something a little bit more wholesome. <laughs> and wonderful. So someone uh, in the comments of my last video, my last nostalgia video, actually reminded me about these last two, which are linked. <laughs> and I've always looked back so fondly on these and found them super wholesome. But I do think that if they were a thing now, if they were starting now, we would have just found it super cringe. <laughs> So the Pinku Project was an idol group that was uh, based in Toronto, I think, in Canada, and they were formed in 2009. Their idea was to bring like kawaii culture to the West. And they definitely encapsulated the idea of like kawaii at the time. But at the time, that was very cringe. <laughs> uh, kawaii culture has drastically changed from to being much more of like be yourself and express yourself and your individuality and you can look any way uh, you can be anyone basically you can be any age any gender any size any height any race literally anything and be kawaii definitely before kawaii culture it didn't have that it kind of was like you have to be a tiny little baby <laughs> and talk like a baby too <laughs> fucking cringe me <laughs> just cringe <laughs> so it was although it was wholesome and cute it was definitely a different time and I think if that was started now, we would really just be like, what is this cringe happening over there? And no one would really pay any attention. But it got a lot of popularity back in the day. <laughs> now, Pinkly Ever After, uh, I'm sure quite a few of you will have heard of Pinkly Ever After. Um, they were a clothing brand also based in Toronto, Canada. I believe it was Toronto. I could be getting this completely wrong, but I'm gonna stick with Toronto, Canada. And the owner of it was one of the members of Pinku Project. And she used the other members of the project to model for her. Her brand concept was that she wanted to kind of be the fairy godmother for everyone who wanted to dress cutely and just create like beautiful, cute, cute clothing. It was heavily, heavily, heavily inspired by Harajuku fashion, but she didn't put a specific label to it. Um, so she came up with like a lot of different pieces and accessories and things like that and a lot of it could be used uh, in Lolita but some of it wasn't Lolita at all. It was definitely more of like a magical girl-esque inspired fashion. Super over the top and very cartoony. Very much reminiscent of things, the like outfits in Precure and things like that. Um, very, very cutesy, very pink, very pastel, uh, lots of ribbons and poof and just cuteness. <laughs> I think what kind of confuses me about the brand is that I've always looked at it and I've always thought these aren't the most intricate pieces and the designs are a little bit clumsy, but there's something so wholesome about that clumsiness. I think because it's not so detailed, they tended to look a lot more costumey. But again, there was just something so wholesome about it. <laughs> anyway, uh, I think in 2015, she announced that the store was closing. She said that she was basically having to sacrifice her own ideals uh, for money so that she could keep the business going and she just didn't want to produce anything less than her best. So she abandoned it. Okay, she said no more. What I've done is out there and now you may fight for the scraps. <laughs> you could just tell that she just really wanted to bring kawaii fashion to the Western world. She really wanted people to 
be able to express themselves through kawaii fashion and she really tried her hardest to enable that um she reached out to a lot of content creators and she started this thing called the happy and cute virus which didn't really take off but uh the idea was to kind of infect someone you know with like kawaii fashion to dress them in kawaii fashion basically and increase people's knowledge on what kawaii fashion actually was i really miss her stuff but i think that if she felt that she was having to sacrifice her individuality and her originality um for money then it was for the best that it closed but i do hope that wherever she is i think she's in south korea now i hope that she is living her best life and i definitely want to one day have one piece of pinkly ever after's clothing in my wardrobe it's just super rare now pinkly ever after clothing is so super rare i don't remember the last time i saw something from pinkly ever after go up on sale but if you ever see anything from pinkly ever after go up on sale now you know what the brand is <laughs> and now you understand why it'd probably be priced so highly <laughs> And also send me a link because I might want to buy it. So that was a little bit more nostalgia for you guys. I hope you guys found this nostalgic. And if not, I hope I introduced you to something new. Or old, I guess. I hope I introduced you to something old. <laughs> so thank you all so much for watching. And as always, thank you for liking, commenting and subscribing. And I will see you in my next video. Bye!